This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out the YouTube original channel UCTV Prime at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Our speaker today is Daryl Duffy of Stanford University Graduate School of Business. In his talk, he will give us his thoughts on the possibilities of restructuring the financial system. Uh, given the events of recent years, it's difficult to think of a topic of greater importance, uh, whether you're someone in the 1% or someone in the 99%. Daryl is the Dean Winter Witter Distinguished Professor of Finance at Stanford Graduate School of Business. He is a prolific author of academic papers on asset valuation, banking, derivatives, and credit risk, among other topics. Um, he has also written a number of books geared toward a non-specialist audience. His most recent book is titled, How Big Banks Fail and What to Do About It. Uh, we have some copies of that book available for purchase after the round table. Uh, so you can get a signed uh, copy of the book. Daryl has served as the president of the American Finance Association in 2009. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, I could literally go on and on with the list of his distinctions and accolades, um, but you would rather hear him talk, and I would too. So I'll stop here and turn the program over to him. Thanks so much, Margie. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's wonderful. I just had a chance to meet uh, quite a number of you, and I have some old friends uh, here in the audience. Uh, and I love San Diego, so invite me back again soon, please. I, I also want to thank uh, Briona and Devaney and, and Sue King for uh, providing this wonderful facility and getting us uh, organized today. Um, I'm going to, as, as Margie suggested, talk about some changes that are going on in the plumbing of the financial system. This is material that I'm preparing um, for a sequel. In that book, um, which is called How Big Banks Fail, I was focusing on the nodes of the financial system, meaning the large financial, uh, systemically important financial institutions. And now I'm pulling back and focusing more on the whole system, the network of links and nodes, and trying to understand where the fragilities exist in our financial system and how they're changing largely because of the last financial crisis. And they are changing in a big way. So as we go through this, I'm going to talk about how uh, the manner in which the large financial institutions are connected to each other, to their clients, and to the central bank ha um, has changed quite a lot, um, in some ways better and in some ways not so good, uh, because of, mainly because of regulation following um, the financial crisis of 2007 and 2009. And you might say, gosh, isn't that all over yet? Uh, you probably heard about 55 talks on the financial crisis. And by now, the regulators should have figured it all out, and we should be on our way again. No, this is, this is a big project. There's about 10 years worth of additional financial engineering to be done to get the financial system where the regulators want to have it. I'm focusing not on what I understand from having discussed uh, at, at my table this morning um, that many of you are involved in, um, uh, but rather on the core of the interbank system, that is, the large banks, how they connect to each other and uh, to the central bank and their clients. And as you know, when that core of the interbank system breaks down, uh, gets clogged up, there are defaults, or no one is willing uh, to perform transactions with anyone else, uh, that affects not only the, uh, the financial system, but affects the whole macro economy. You can think of this interbank system on which I'm focusing 
as uh, a mechanism, a rather complicated mechanism, for transferring risks through the whole uh, macro economy, for transferring credit and liquidity. And of course, if it gets blocked up, um, then the whole macro economy has to slow down, as we saw uh, during that last crisis. We're still experiencing uh, high unemployment rates, a big macroeconomic impact, even after all this time. So to illustrate how one of the nodes in this link uh, can break down, and therefore for the system to start breaking down um, in a uh, sort of contagious way, this is just to illustrate the sudden loss of liquidity of, of Bear Stearns, a bank for which we happen to have data, um, in its last days. The idea being that these large systemically important banks can fail not only from a general concern over solvency, but how that solvency concern gets translated into a liquidity um, problem by which the bank simply has to stop operating. So I'm operating, the, everything I'm discussing here is kind of close to the edge of failure. What, how does the system perform? Now the most important um, uh, valve in the financial system is the central bank. In the US, that's the Fed, of course, and it provides liquidity on a day-to-day -day basis to the banks through its normal monetary operations. Um, what has been normal, what was normal uh, was uh, daily um, uh, purchases and sales of financial securities in order to um, control short-term interest rates, something that Jim Hamilton is an expert on. Uh, but since the financial crisis, as you know, interest rates have been sitting on the floor and the central bank is now using uh, interest on reserves to, to, to maintain liquidity in the system. It's not those daily normal monetary operations on which I'm focusing here, it's emergency liquidity. So how does the central bank serve as a source of lender of last resort liquidity to the financial system? Those, as you know, those are restricted uh, normally to regulated banks. So before the financial uh, crisis, it would have been very abnormal for the Fed to provide liquidity lender of last resort financing to a non-bank, but it was possible under emergency section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act. It is no longer possible uh, since the Dodd-Frank Act for the Fed to do that. The Congress said, we don't want you making these discretionary loans to non-banks. You are restricted to doing that only for financial institutions that are banks through, through what is known as the discount window. As you know, the European Central Bank has been using its version of the discount window, which are refinancing operations, heroically in the last few months to serve exactly this purpose in Europe uh, in order to mitigate its liquidity and solvency crisis. And there, as we know, the story there is not over. Uh, Spanish yields are back up around 5.8%. Um, there's going to be, I, I predict, some severe dislocations in Europe. And at some point, that liquidity will not be enough. But it's been, in, in the short run, it's been a way for European banks to avoid a severe liquidity crisis. If the central bank can provide that liquidity to a bank, it can then continue to provide liquidity to its clients. A new piece of plumbing, and I am focusing on changes here, a new piece of plumbing in the financial system uh, that arose during the financial crisis and is continuing to be used are, uh, are what, is, what are known as currency swap lines. These, these connect central bank to central bank um, offering, for example, U.S. dollar loans to the ECB, the European Central Bank, so that it can provide those dollars itself to European banks. And you might say, well, those European banks can buy those dollars on the open market. Yes, but it's also the case uh, in a financial crisis that U.S. banks can buy dollars on the open market, but that's not the point. The point is that they have difficulty getting financing. And by virtue of these currency swap lines, the European Central Bank can provide lender of last resort financing in dollar form to European banks. This is a very important new piece of plumbing in the financial system. It was turned on again last fall during the severe dislocation in Europe preceding those European Central Bank uh, LTROs, long-term refinancing operations, and mitigated that crisis. And I think it's going to be, um, this plumbing is going to be here to stay every time the crisis uh, turns up in ferocity. Another new piece of plumbing in the financial system that showed up during the financial crisis is called a broad credit facility. The primary example of this is the primary dealer credit facility by which firms like 
uh, Lehman, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and other primary dealers which are not banks were able to obtain financing from the central bank during the crisis. Of course, this is secured financing. They have to provide securities to the central bank. But as a group, they were able to participate in these broad facilities, and those were used enormously successfully during the financial crisis to mitigate the depth of that crisis. Now, these are allowed under the Dodd-Frank Act going forward. So remember the 13-3 emergency lending of the central bank is now not available to individual financial institutions, but it is available under Dodd-Frank, provided it's provided under a broad credit facility. And I, I expect that we will see these used again when the next financial crisis comes. Another new piece of plumbing, which is under Title II of the Dodd-Frank Act, is the ability of the central bank to provide liquidity to financial market utilities, FMUs. Uh, an example of this being a central counterparty, which is, um, as you will see later in this discussion, it, which is a, um, essentially a clearinghouse, a way for uh, uh, participants in derivatives to get guaranteed that they're going to get paid um, even if their original counterparty does not perform. So I'll come back to CCPs later, but this important new piece of plumbing provides liquidity to dedicated infrastructure like tri-party repo clearing services if they emerge, central clearing parties, and other uh, dedicated plumbing of the financial system. So altogether, we have a significant amount of new pipes and valves in the system, with one important pipe removed being the 13-3 emergency um, liquidity that was provided to firms like uh, AIG uh, during the financial crisis. Now this 13-3 um, restriction is very important when we consider the fact that let's say J.P. Morgan's broker-dealer is not a bank. So if the Fed were to provide liquidity to J.P. Morgan, it must come through the bank under, because of the Dodd-Frank Act. It cannot go directly to the broker-dealer. What is the implication of that? It means that if the broker-dealer needs liquidity, it would have to get it from its bank, and in return, the bank could get it from the Fed. Now, those transactions between a broker-dealer and a bank are highly restricted they must be at arm's length. They must be on market terms. They are restricted to a limited set of financial instruments. And all of these restrictions, since the Dodd-Frank Act was passed, are now highly limited relative to what they were before the financial crisis. These, this uh, is a revision of Section 23A of the Federal Reserve Act. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. But for many, it's a very obscure piece of financial legislation that turns out to be very important in limiting the degree to which a broker-dealer can get liquidity from a central bank, even if it's part of a regulated bank holding company. Now, this, is, uh, this has costs and benefits, of course. The most important cost is that if a broker-dealer gets into trouble, it will be able to rely less on the central bank for liquidity, which gives me some concerns. Now, I'm going to spend a significant amount of time on what's known as tri-party repo, uh, a very important piece of plumbing of the financial system that is undergoing significant revision right now because of some fragilities in this plumbing that showed up during the financial crisis when, for example, Lehman failed. And I want to alert you. I'm working uh, with the Lehman Estate on a related matter, so I have a conflict of interest, but I'm going to try to give you the, uh, my, uh, my straight view on, on um, some concerns I have about um, <coughs> the ability of a broker-dealer to get uh, tri-party repo loans overnight through this system of tri-party repo. So I'm going to explain this slowly. I'm going to focus more on this than on anything else, because right now I view it as probably the weakest link in the financial system. A single valve, or actually two, there are two tri-party clearing banks, J.P. Morgan Chase and Bank of New York Mellon, that are performing these services uh, for the, for the broker-dealers 
um, that support our securities and, and other uh, broker-dealer industry. Now, the way that this works is that a cash investor, which is typically a money market fund or a securities lender, there may be some present here, would provide cash liquidity to a dealer bank such as Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, um, and they would do it with the infrastructure provided by a tri-party clearing bank, which nominally acts as an agent for this transaction. In principle, all it's doing is offering its facilities for valuing the collateral securities provided by the dealer bank and, and, and for providing account services for the cash investors and the dealer banks on its own balance sheet. So for example, if uh, Fidelity wants to lend money uh, to Goldman Sachs, uh, then Fidelity will place the cash in an account at, uh, I think Goldman's uh, tri-party clearing bank is, is Boney, Bank of New York Mellon, so it would place its cash in an account at Mellon, and then Mellon would place the uh, cash in the account of Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs would provide collateralizing securities, which would be held on the account of Fidelity at uh, Bank of New York Mellon, and then the next day the transaction would unwind. These are overnight transactions. Fidelity would get its cash back with interest, and Goldman Sachs would get its securities back, and then they would do the same thing the next day. And it all sounds fine, except what happens when Goldman Sachs, if it ever were to get in trouble, is having difficulty, and Fidelity is thinking about maybe we don't want to lend to Goldman Sachs today, maybe we will lend to some other dealer bank whose uh, credit quality is, is superior. However unlikely you think that event may be, I personally think it's quite unlikely, it's not the sort of event that we, would ev we, we should even want to allow to happen because, of course, if Goldman were unable to roll over its loans overnight or any other dealer bank were unable to do so, uh, we would have uh, clearly a very serious problem um, in our financial system, not only the failure of an important dealer bank, but also a fire sale of securities into the open market, which would depress the prices of those securities and possibly cause knock-on consequences. Now, there's a number of ways that this can happen, and I want to go through some of the mechanics of this. You might be surprised to learn that even though these repos are overnight loans from directly from the cash lender to the cash borrower, during the day, intraday, those loans are rolled onto the books of the clearing bank itself. So Bank of New York Mellon, in my example, would become the intraday provider of credit to Goldman Sachs until it arranged its new loans at the end of the day uh, for another day. So I want to I want to focus on the fragility associated with that roll-on and roll-off of daily overnight loans. Just to, to uh, maybe at this early hour of the day get your senses a little alerted about the importance of this, every day all of the major dealer banks are borrowing in excess of $100 billion overnight every day through this market. It's a very important uh, source of liquidity to the dealers. Now, <clears throat> one of the ways that this, uh, the sensitivity of this important piece of the financial system um, is being controlled is that with the Dodd-Frank Act and with the Basel III requirements coming in for capital and liquidity, those dealer banks will be required to have more capital and more liquidity through what's known as the liquidity coverage ratio test, which would reduce their reliance on overnight funding. So that's, that's on that side. On the side of the money market funds, we are moving, and I think most of you who are involved in the financial industry will be quite familiar with money market funds, we are moving from a system which is called stable net asset value, or in Europe, constant net asset value, to some adjustment of this um, regulation of money market funds. One of the proposed adjustments is to move from stable net asset value to a mark-to-market -market or floating net asset value, by which when you write a check on your money market fund for $1,000, uh, today that means 1,000 shares. In the future, that will mean an unknown number of shares, or, another, or if you write a check for 1,000 shares, it will mean an unknown number of dollars because um, your shares will be marked to market rather than always marked at one dollar per share. And uh, I don't know about you, but before I got into this, I just took it for granted that it was just like a bank account. And when I wrote a thousand on it, that was always a thousand dollars, not an unknown number of dollars. The, the financial industry is not well set up to deal with variable net asset value. However, 
Um, it is a strong proposal because of the incentive to run as a cash investor in money market funds when you sense that perhaps your money market fund may be exposed to a weak source of collateral. For example, suppose your money market fund has lent money to one of the dealer banks and now the, one of the dealer banks is in the news for uh, 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 being suspected of some insolvency or lack of liquidity. Then not knowing how that might affect your money market fund and not having the time to do a thorough analysis of the collateral behind, backing your money market funds, you might just, just say to yourself, well, what the heck, I'll just take my money out. And that's exactly what institutional investors did when Lehman went down. One of the money market funds called the Reserve Primary Fund broke the buck, meaning some of its assets exposed to Lehman reduced the market value of a share so far below a dollar that it had to get remarked even under the current stable net asset value rules. When investors became aware of that, they ran not only from the reserve primary fund, but from all money market funds in essence. So just to make, make this clear, about $400 billion, representing 40% of institutional investment in money market funds, was withdrawn from the money market fund industry over the course of two weeks after the failure of Lehman. It would have continued probably to the point at which none of the dealers running our financial system would have been able to continue had the Treasury Department not guaranteed money market funds two weeks after the failure of Lehman. That's a very stark, you know, again, early in the day, but it's a very stark reminder of how sensitive this money market fund complex oh, is. So um, a, a variable net asset value may mitigate that because people won't be rushing for the exits um, uh, hoping to get out at a dollar a share before the shares are marked down if the shares are always being marked down appropriately. That will reduce the incentive to run. Another proposal of which I'm a part through a group called the Squam Lake Group is rather than take away the constant net asset value or stable NAV product is to leave it in place but to require the money market fund sponsors to back up the value of a dollar per share with a little bit of a buffer. And there's a lot of argumentation, particularly in the Investment Company Institute, about whether that buffer is appropriate and if so, how large. Uh, earlier this week, you may have read that the Investment Company Institute has proposed to start with a buffer of three basis points. Now, personally, I find that odd, puzzling, that they imagine that three basis points would be enough of a buffer in the event that one of the um, uh, borrowers to the, from these money market funds, such as a large dealer bank, were to fail. These money market funds have exposures to European banks today, which are in excess of 2 or 3% each. That is, one money market fund is exposed to one large uh, commercial European bank, not by three basis points, but more, more like 300 basis points of its market value. So the idea that three basis points might be enough of a buffer is a bit, a bit silly if you ask me. Uh, even, even so, the industry is resisting the idea of a capital buffer. It is resisting the idea of a variable net asset value. And it is also resisting the proposal uh, that has recently come on the table at the SEC, the primary regulator, of a redemption gate, which uh, understandably would give pause for concern for many cash investors and money market funds that don't want to have their so-called cash gated preventing them from being able to withdraw 100 cents on the dollar whenever they wish. Now, all of these proposals that have been made to reform money market funds are very unpopular in the financial industry and would probably reduce the, uh, let's say, viability of the money market fund industry, would be less commercially viable as a product, would probably reduce the amount of investments in these money market funds and push the investment somewhere else, which would have to be regulated for runs just as carefully. If it were to go into unsecured bank deposits, of, of course, those are uninsured to, an effect, you know, to any effective degree because institutional investors surely are not protected by a $250,000 uh, deposit insurance um, fund. So um, Mary Shapiro and her fellow commissioners are under a very high degree of pressure over what to do about the money market fund industry, and they have yet to decide. And at this point, um, 
I have a hard time predicting exactly what they, what they may do, but, it, but some uh, sort of change is required here. Here's what happened to Lehman, its book of financial instruments uh, that it funded through the tri-party repo market of all types essentially disappeared in its last day. It became unable to roll over its enormous amount of overnight loans, which were roughly at 200 billion a week before, and shrunk to zero. It could, it could only get liquidity from the Fed, and as you know, it failed in the week of September 13th, 2008. One of the important reforms to this plumbing of the financial system is right at the heart of the plumbing at the clearing banks. So we've talked about the money market funds, which are cash investors. We've talked about the dealer banks, which are cash borrowers. The valve in the middle, the tri-party clearing bank, is also being revised as we speak. So pre-reform, when the cash investors get their money back with interest in the morning, the clearing banks, that is J.P. Morgan Chase or Bank of New York Mellon, are providing intraday cash loans of in excess of $100 billion to each of their dealer bank clients. And then in the afternoon, those uh, overnight loans are renewed and put back uh, in place so that cash investors like money market funds are now on the hook for exposures to the dealer banks. Now that interim exposure of the clearing banks raises some concerns because if a clearing bank were to say to a dealer, you know what, we're not really happy um, about taking your credit onto our books during the day, something might go wrong today, and we're refusing to roll your loans onto our books during the day, that dealer bank would be unable to survive. It would almost fail instantly, which is a source of concern to both the dealer bank and the clearing bank. If the clearing bank weren't to do this, perhaps the clearing bank would feel that it was um, at risk. If the clearing bank were to refuse to do that, the dealer bank would be at risk. Uh, leading up to the failure of Lehman, J.P. Morgan um, expressed its concern to Lehman and demanded more and more collateral new clearing agreements and, other, and placed other demands on Lehman, uh, which put Lehman in a difficult position, to say the least. As I said, I, I can't go much further, or I, I alerted you to my conflict of interest there. I can't go much further into that. Um, but that is a significant concern. It's an ongoing matter of litigation. Post-reform, what the Fed, which the New York Fed is the primary regulator of this system, um, what it is trying to do is to keep the cash investors on the hook during the day and then to roll off these positions in a rapid, controlled way so that the clearing bank is never significantly at risk to a dealer bank. The objective being a maximum of 10% of these loans are ever on the books of the clearing bank at any one time. Um, there is a lot of infrastructure that has to be redesigned to make this work. It has, some progress has been made, but a few weeks ago the New York Fed pulled the plug on this project expressing dissatisfaction with the progress that has been made by the industry group and indicating its desire to take the reins in its own hands. And uh, we don't know yet exactly what it will propose. My personal view is that these tri-party repo clearing services are much more appropriately handled by a dedicated financial market utility that's not inside a very large complex financial institution like J.P. Morgan Chase or Bank of New York Mellon. So if these tri-party repo clearing services were pulled out and made into an industry regulated monopoly, then it would have A, enough incentive to invest in infrastructure to make this roll on and roll off go much more smoothly, and B, would not be wrapped inside a large complex financial institution, making that financial institution too important to fail. Despite what you may have been hearing um, from Washington about no financial institution being too important to fail from this point, that is certainly not the case. It, is, it would definitely not be um, appropriate to allow either of these two clearing banks to fail simply because they include the, uh, the key valve in the financial system, this tri-party clear, repo clearing service. So that, that reform is ongoing. Now, I'm not going to have time to talk about 
everything in my slide deck today, but um, I will, if anyone wants to send me uh, your email, I will reply with a copy of the paper um, that covers this material uh, that I presented at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve a couple of weeks ago, where central bank governors from all over the world came uh, to meet and discuss uh, changes in the financial system since the financial crisis. But I will spend the last few minutes that I have talking about uh, concerns I have about prime brokerage. Uh, now, I'm sure that there are some participants in the hedge fund community here present this morning, and most of you um, uh, in the hedge fund industry obtain prime brokerage services through one of the large dealer banks, like Goldman Sachs, uh, like Morgan Stanley, like J.P. Morgan. And what that means is they perform your account services, they may do you some of your risk management reporting, they may prepare some of your uh, uh, transactions reporting, they execute your transactions. But the function that I want to focus on is the fact that most hedge funds, not all, post their securities that they own on account at their prime broker. And they also keep their free cash at the prime broker. Now the prime broker can then use the cash that's provided, not for itself, but to help service other prime brokerage clients under restrictions of, of the Securities and Exchange Act called 15C3. And under the same restriction, can provide financing to itself by posting those securities to a third party investor who would lend cash to the prime broker. And that helps the prime broker provide cash lending to the hedge funds, allowing them to achieve leverage. And this all sounds fine until a prime broker itself um, uh, gets in trouble. And at that point, the hedge funds may say to themselves, gosh, I've got my cash and my securities there. Do I really want to leave them there? I actually got a phone call from London uh, the weekend that Lehman was failing asking me, uh, well, I have my uh, prime brokerage at Bank X. Maybe I should move to Bank Y uh, to protect myself in case um, the failure of Lehman should propagate through the other prime brokers. So you can imagine that when hedge funds pull out, that would reduce the financial flexibility of a prime broker, let's say Morgan Stanley, on which I'm going to focus. Here's an indication of the securities that, the amount of securities in billions of US dollars that were posted to Morgan Stanley that it was permitted to repledge to other financial institutions for financing. So in excess of 900 billion on all the reporting dates leading up to the failure of Lehman, and then around 200 to 300 million, nearly 300 million on the reporting dates after the fail of, failure of Lehman, a reduction of about $600 billion in securities that Morgan Stanley could post for financing itself in order to provide financing to its, to its prime brokerage clients. Now that 600 billion represents a sizable reduction in financial flexibility to Morgan Stanley as its prime brokerage clients fled Morgan Stanley worried that it may fail. Morgan Stanley's liquidity pool, and this is from data released under a Freedom of Information Act uh, uh, inquiry, that's not, pub not widely known publicly, that Morgan Stanley's liquidity pool dropped from 176.8 billion to only 91.5 billion over the course of about 10 days. That's actually about one working week after the failure of Lehman. $85 billion reduction in cash liquidity at Morgan Stanley, most of which was due to a runoff in prime brokerage. And surprisingly, a lot of that was in New York where Rule 15C3 that I described earlier, limiting leverage provided to clients should have limited this runoff in liquidity at Morgan Stanley, but for some reason that I am still investigating has not, was not successful in limiting the loss of liquidity to Morgan Stanley. In London, 17.6 billion of liquidity was lost, and London does not have restrictions like the US, Rule 15C3. Um, so this is, uh, uh, this is a matter that, that needs to be much more carefully investigated there have been no changes in the design of the prime brokerage uh, financing or this the particular plumbing of the financial system since the Dodd-Frank Act. It doesn't come up at all in the Dodd-Frank Act. It doesn't play a significant role in the new Basel capital and liquidity requirements. It's essentially an untreated part of the financial reform that's ongoing. I'd like to thank Daryl for a fabulous talk.